Hello and welcome to Hot Issues. This week, we are taking a look at some of the very disturbing issues, some of the issues which create the impression that uh, we could be heading in for a very hard time. We'll be talking about the controversy over the voters' register, the recruitment of Ghanaians to join the ISIS, the district-level elections, and generally the role of the National Peace Council in ensuring that this country can enjoy a measure of peace and stability. Welcome to Hot Issues. Hello and welcome back to Hot Issues. And as I said from the very beginning, we are taking a look at some of the very, very hot issues, issues to do with the alleged recruitment of Ghanaians to join the ISIS, issues about the district-level elections and the controversy over the National Voters' Register. And then, most importantly, the role of the National Peace Council in all of this in ensuring that we can attain a measure of peace and stability in our country. And I have the distinguished pleasure, we have the distinguished pleasure of welcoming to the studio the Reverend Professor Emmanuel Asante, Chairman of the National Peace Council. Sir, you're welcome to the studio. Thank you. Yes, sir. So what is the Peace Council doing now? The Peace Council, as you know, um, it's been set up as a statutory body to facilitate peace in the country. It means that we work with um, stakeholders, civil society, different groupings, to facil facilitate peace. What we are doing at the moment um, is that the Peace Council and the University of Cape Coast did a study um, trying to look at hotspots in, 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 in our country that can be a hotspot for conflict, that can degenerate into violence. And you probably know that we launched this, this, this study in Kumasi, and uh, it turned out that a lot of the areas where there are hotspots are areas where there are chief tenancy disputes, land issues, resource issues because of the Galamse problems here and there. And fortunately, we've been able to put in place the regional peace councils who are dealing with some of these issues in their own regions. For, for example, when you go to Kumasi, they've done a lot of work together with the Asantehini's um, outfit. In the Brahafu region, where there are issues there, the Peace Council is, in, in, is there engaging the, um, the traditional council, the security services, and, and stakeholders to try and facilitate peace in those areas. Even the, 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 in, in, in the Volta region, the Alabanyo issue that has been there for 90 years, um, the regional Peace Council is still working on that. Um, it's not been easy, but at least um, when people come together to talk and begin to see the need for peace, we think that we'll be able to find a solution to the problem. At the national level, the 2016 election is just around the corner. We've seen um, what happened in the Talensi by elections, and we're not taking anything for granted. So what we have outlined and the kinds of things that we would want to do, as we did in the 2012, is to try to engage all the stakeholders, namely the Electoral Commission. We, we will be having a meeting with the Electoral Commission sometime um, this week. We will be meeting with the security services. We'll be meeting with the political parties. And of course, we will also be meeting with the media and other groupings. We will not do this alone, but we'll try and involve other civil society in this venture. The whole idea is not to try to create um, a confused situation, but to try to help Ghanaians to understand that we develop when there is peace in our country and that um, you don't fight injustice with violence and that it is possible to address issues that you are not pleased with in a very peaceful manner. These are the sort of things that we are doing. The Secretary is working on all these things, and very soon we will roll out these plans 
at the national level in view of the 2016 elections. Are there other issues? For example, there has been this report about uh, two Ghanaians joining ISIS mm. and also the fact that ISIS has a training uh, recruitment base in Ghana. Mm. It's a matter of concern. Um, I must tell you that as I'm sitting here right now, we have not, as a peace council, we haven't sat down to formulate any plan to address that issue. But as Ghanaians who are, as Ghanaians who are living in the country, it is a matter of concern to us, knowing especially what the ISIS are doing and their objectives and ambitions. If you have Ghanaians getting in there, especially when Boko Haram, which is um, just close to us, have pledged allegiance to this group, then you have every reason to be concerned because you're talking about people who are not just there fighting for some kind of cause in terms of injustice, but who want to establish themselves a caliphate and who would want to, you know, have dominion in, 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 in the state of ours with violence. I mean, and if that is to happen, it wouldn't augur well for us. So it's a matter of concern. Unfortunately, um, I wouldn't say unfortunately, it hasn't come into the radar, but I, I, it's one of the things that we've been talking about it. And when we meet to outline some of the programs that we have, it will definitely feature prominently. All the things that you've just spoken about, I mean, mm. if everybody was law-abiding, mm. would there be the need to, to initiate all of these measures if everybody just behaved, mm. you know, mm. in conformity with the law? Yes. Wouldn't we have peace and stability? Definitely. But we see, you know that we live in a society where you are not going to get everybody conforming with the norms and with the, the rules that we have. In our country, I have always said that we have everything in place, you know, to address these issues. And if we would abide by the kinds of things we ourselves have agreed on, we're not going to have that. And it is said that as Mboninti na Hinfiesiho, we, you know, it has become necessary for, our, for, for the country to um, have a group like a uh, an institution like the National Peace Council and others to come in to talk about these things because of our pension for, you know, breaking rules and, and not abiding by the kinds of things that we need to do. And so um, we will always have this so long as we have not reached perfection yet. And, and so long as we are in this world, I don't think we're going to have it. Are we not particularly worried that a lot of the non-compliance with mm. laws and so on comes from political parties and their leaders? Mm -hmm. It must be a matter of concern to every Ghanaian who loves peace. Um, there is no two ways about that. The, um, you know that 2012, we did something in respect of impudence. You know, um, the fact that people would easily break rules with impudence and it's as if nobody really cares about what they do you see it not only even at that level but even on the roads everywhere you go there's too much indiscipline and lack of you know us not being mindful of of the things that could really um, create mayhem in our, in our country and anybody who cares about peace in this country must be very much concerned about what is happening. You know. how, how do you feel when you hear leaders of political parties make statements to the effect that uh, our position is not negotiable? You take our position or... No, I, I, don't, I don't think that, you know, take it or leave it would really um, bring us what we are looking for. I have always said that jaw jawing is better than war warring okay it is important you may have a position and there's nothing wrong in people holding different positions but then the positions cannot be non-negotiable because then it is imposing one's ideas on other people um, so as far as i'm concerned my position your position and others position we must sit and talk and in some cases i may have to shift it is important for us to come into the middle position and then say that we have reached a consensus. Consensus is not something that you would say that I have had 100% of the ideas that are put forward. But at least you have been able to reach somewhere. You've been able to negotiate. You've been able to take and leave. 
you know, to, you take something and you also get rid of some of your own ideas. When we do this in a, in a democratic country like ours, I think we'll go for it. But if I come out and say, this is my position, uh, mm -hmm. you either take it or leave it, then I'm saying that I'm not ready to listen, but I want you to listen. And that, that's not the best thing to go, that's not the right way to go about things. In respect of elections, it mm. appears that the, one of the biggest controversies is about the voters register. Mm. What is the position of the Peace Council? P, the, P, the position of the Peace Council, it's, I have articulated that position. We have heard people who have raised qualms about the existing voters register. And if you listen to the different positions, almost everybody seems to be saying that there is something, something ought to be done about the voters register. And I'm saying that this is not the first time we are hearing this. You know, you know I mean, way, 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 way back, even during the time of uh, Professor Mills, uh, people, we, we talked about that. During the time of President Kufo, we talked about that. So it means that we need to sit down. What is wrong with it? And then we put our heads together. And I have said that we should not even, the Peace Council, you know, our position is that we should not even leave it with the political parties alone, civil society, and interested Ghanaians must also come in. When we have talked and we have, you know, discussed the matter, we will be able to find a solution to the problem. Definitely whoever is raising an issue will have will think that this is the way to go. Others might think that this is the way to go. Others might think that this is the way to go. The National Peace Council will not stick its neck out and say, we support position A or position B. As peacemakers, we are saying, bring all your positions together. Let us talk. And let us, as you come to talk, be ready to listen to what a consensus will come up with. Mm -hmm. And if it's agreed that this is the way to go, let's all go that way. And, and, and find peaceful solution to, to the problem. But if I'm coming and I'm saying that this is my package, take it or leave it, um, I'm afraid it's a recipe for conflict. What about the history of the voters' register itself? You mm. do know that we've changed the voters' register many times mm. up to the point where we had a biometric register. Mm. It hasn't solved the problem, has it? Um, definitely. I mean, Chrissy, are we going to have something perfect? But because we are, we're not going to have something that is 100% perfect, we will always have to try as much as possible to perfect it. Perfection is a process. I don't call it a crisis. It's not something that you just get up and all of a sudden you have something that is perfect. Even this, the discussions that are going on, after, even if we're able to bring all of us together to reach a consensus, come 2020, we will still be hearing voices in respect of the voters um, register. Why? Because there are some people who might even want to... Um, you know, register twice. It's possible that way. And why they do that, I don't know. But that is the human nature. You know, and it is not always we are, in, we do, we are, we are so imperfect that we will not be able to detect everything. So there is bound to be conflict in respect of what is happening. Of course, in some cases, if the measure is said that, I mean, I, mean I, I have never known of any voters register anywhere in the world that anybody, if you were to go down to other people, they would say that they are happy with it. But to a certain measure, you know, if the thing is out of proportion and people feel that this is the situation, then you want to talk about it. You want to find a solution. What I have known in this country, well, in terms of the debate that is going on, is that even though everybody is saying that, you know, there is something wrong with it, we are not in agreement as to how to address that issue. So the problem is not with the bloated or the, the non-credible, non if I may put it that way, of the voters' register. But the problem lies with how do we address that particular issue. And there are many ways of addressing it. I'm saying let us talk. When we jaw-jaw, we should be able to find a solution to that problem. 
I would wish that the, 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 the Electoral Commission that has the mandate to, you know, um, organize elections in this country will be up to it. They will be able to hear with an objective mind and come up with something. Once they come up with something, I hope that we should be in a position to say, well, this is what by our own discussions we've come to. So let's accept it and use it. We don't have anything perfect in this world. The Electoral Commission has, has showed a roadmap. Mm. Are you happy with it? Yes, I think some of the things that I'm talking about, we, we are talking about is what they are doing. We're going to meet them anyway. <laughs> and I'm sure that they will educate us the more so that we would, would know. We are saying bring in stakeholders. Don't limit it to the political parties. Because, you know, political parties tend to take entrenched positions. And mind you, there are a lot of people in this country who vote. They, they may be sympathetic to one party or the other. The fact that I vote means that I'm sympathetic to a particular exactly. party or position. But there are people who may not be actively, you know, engaged in partisan politics. They may have their own ideas as well. Let's not think that they have nothing to do. Let's sit. Let's talk. I think it's a step in the right direction. Um, if the Electoral Commission was the Peace Council, to be part of the you know, facilitation of the discussions, we would be more than willing. But I must let the public know that the Peace Council is not an addendum to the um, Electoral Commission. Because in this country, some people think that the Peace Council is an addendum to the... That's not our job. But we, our concern is that peace will prevail in whatever we do. And we will be willing to assist if, where we can. Well, in a situation where the parties appear to have taken entrenched positions, mm. what would dialogue bring? We know their positions. Some of them have said that their positions are not negotiable. Why would they be talking when they don't want to listen? Well... Anybody who takes an entrenched position before you enter into dialogue, you are saying that, no, I, I'm not going in for dialogue. Because in a dialogue, I may, be, I may feel strong about my position, but it, as I sit, you know, I, I want to believe that everybody who is talking about the electoral voters register is very much concerned about this country. I keep on saying that it's not my party. Is not my position, my own personal interest, but it's Ghana that must come first. And whatever we are discussing, we go there to discuss in the interest of Mother Ghana. So we go there with my position. Obviously, if you don't have a position, you have nothing also to put on the table. So you must have a position, you must put your position on the table. And as you expect people to listen, you also listen to people. And then you know, through negotiations and all that, we should be able to come to a consensus. Um, and trend positions, I must stress, will not help this country. Now, Prof, beyond the voters' register and mm. the controversy around it, are there some other issues related to elections? Quite a number of issues, apart from the voters' register. I do believe that, you know... Um, Vigilance is, is key to every successful election. And this is where <laughs> I have no problems with Afarijan when he kept on saying that the name of the game is vigilance. Um, I had the way, way, way back in the 80s, I had the opportunity to be um, a panel, you know, a part of a, a group of people who discussed these issues at Koforidia. And the message that ran through was vigilance. It means that we need to train people who know what they are on about. Look, if you look at our elections, since we started, we have tried as much as possible to improve it. We, can, we should not say that we haven't done that. We started with an opaque ballot, mm -hmm. ballot box, and God only knows the way people felt about the whole thing, you know. And then we, we cried that we needed a transparent one. We had it. We had a, a card, electoral, you know, voters card that didn't have any uh, photo on it. And 
we yell, we cried, we had it black and white. And then we said, let's go color. We now have color. Then at some point, we're not happy with all that. We said, let's go biometric. So we went biometric. Nothing is perfect. Biometric, we went. And we also encountered some difficulties with it, which is, is a machine. It's, 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 an, it's, it's, it's a technology and something that we are using for the very first time. We're bound to encounter all sorts of problems. We need the machines themselves will not do the job for us. It's the people who are trained to use the machines. And in this country, we have even a situation where party, uh, parties have their own representatives represented at polling stations. If you do not educate your party representative to be vigilant, to understand the issues at stake, you're bound to encounter all sorts of difficulties. So for me, Vigilance that is the key. Vigilance is, is the key because if we open our eyes, then we should be in a position to address it. Then, vigilance doesn't mean take the laws also into your hands. Well, welcome back to Hot Issues. And we are in conversation with Reverend Professor Emmanuel Asante, who chairs the National Peace Council. And just before we went on the break, he was talking about the vigilance of the various players in the political process. Now, I'd like us to move from vigilance mm. and look at the complaints that people have made about the Electoral Commission. Mm. There are several individuals and organizations which are questioning the independence of the Electoral Commission and its competence. You've been working with them. What do you think? You know... <laughs> <laughs> when people raise issues of credibility in respect of groupings, you sit back and you want to say, so how do we get a, a credible commission? Does it lie with the way people were appointed to the commission? Are we going to have a situation where you have to do a referendum to appoint people to go into a commission? We have done that. Is it in keeping with the laws of this land? Did we, in the appointment, follow the rules, our constitution? Did we do that? Are the people representative enough? And if I say representative, um, should people within the, the commission wear party tax? Should they wear ethnic tax for people to be able to say that, oh, these are the people who are representing us. I think so far, so far, the elections that we have had in this country, we have every reason to believe that we have had a credible electoral commission. That doesn't mean that people may not have qualms, problems with one or two things. It's a human institution, and you are bound to encounter problems here and there. But... I bet you, if I will say that even if Jesus Christ should come and appoint people in there, individuals may have difficulty with it. As far as I'm concerned, I have no reason to doubt the credibility of the Electoral Commission as it is now. If somebody has problems with it, he is a citizen of this country. He has every right to say that Kwesi is in there. I have difficulty with Kwesi for A, B, C, and it must be looked at on its own merit. Mm -hmm. But as far as I'm concerned, simply saying they are not credible, they are not credible will not really do the thing. We need an institution to man our you know, elections. Mm -hmm. The Electoral Commission is what we have been able to put in place. There are some members of the commission who were appointed during the time of President Kofo, Others were appointed during the time of uh, um, Mr. Rollins. Mr. Rollins. Others were appointed during the time of uh, maybe pr President Mills and others. The fact that they have been appointed by these people doesn't mean that they have been appointed to go and represent them. Mm -hmm. But they have been appointed to go and do service to the country. If we have reasons to believe that a particular person is not doing the right thing, let's talk about that. But simply condemning a whole institution that it is not credible after so many elections that have gone on that has gone to 
you know, different, major, the two major parties in the country, the NDC and PP, I cannot sit here and, and talk about the credibility of the, the non-credibility of the, of the Electoral Commission. Sir, so this week we had the district level elections. Hmm. You've been observing our elections. What are your comments about the district level elections so far? Well, see, I, w I wish that the, the thing will be over today for, for, for me to do objective assessment. I think that the level of interest. This year there's been a lot of education. A number of people who are interested in standing for district elections. I remember when the thing started initially. I mean, who would want to assembly man and those kinds of things? As somebody who grew up in Kumasi and was in Kumasi, I knew how people looked down upon that. Um, mind you, I have become an assembly man before in my, in my hometown. Of oh, course, as a government appointee, oh, okay. you know, so I didn't stand for the elections. But it was when I got in there that I realized that you need people who have what it takes to really manage. Because this country, if you say that you're going to rule the country from top down, you're going to have a problem. The local government is very, very crucial in terms of the democracy of our country. And so education has gone on, and you see the caliber of people who have said that they want to become um, assembly members. That is, that is really good. My problem is with the interest of the voters. You know, when I was coming over here and I was driving through town, it didn't seem to me that something was happening. You know, I have talked to, you know, my own um, young people living in my, in, with me, and I said, have you bothered to go in there? He says, I don't know the, the person who is standing in our area. I, I, I have not met anybody. So it will be very difficult for me to go and say that I'm casting a vote for somebody. And I tell you, we will be lucky if the voters turn out will go past 40 something percent. If we get 50 plus, we should be grateful. Mm. Why? I still think, and I don't know how other people think, I think whether we like it or not, we should begin to look at this district council elections from a partisan perspective. People, the same people who said that they didn't know the, uh, the people who stood in their area, so they wouldn't know how to vote. When I asked them, if the, somebody had identified himself with a, a party of your choice, would you have gone to vote for that person? He says yes. Mm -hmm. So I think we, we must, we need to look at how this, this one will go, but I I think it is important for us to open the doors and allow... There's nothing wrong with us going partisan, even at the local level, uh, at the Elections. local levels. I'm doing politics here. Um, no, no, it's, 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 yes. it's absolutely it's Because right. for me, um, hon honestly, I, I don't even know the person who is standing in my area. Mm -hmm. I've not met anybody. He's not said anything. I don't know... That person's capacity to be able to do anything for, for. So, honestly, as I sit here, I must confess, my interest in the whole thing is not like the interest I will show at the, at the, at the um, parliamentary mm -hmm. and presidential elections. Mm -hmm. Now, sir, you, you've been part of the assembly system before. Mm -hmm. Do you still think that government should be appointing one third of the members? Is that not an affront to the principle of decentralization? It completely defeats the, 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 the purpose because, I mean, people who are appointed, how many of them will be able to rise above their appointment and say that, look, I'm here to do a job for the people. And so irrespective of whoever appointed me, if it's black, it's going to be black and all that. They will not think that I have to go to to somebody who appointed me. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why I think that the local council... It, uh, local level um, um, government, local governance should be partisan. I, 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 I will still want to canvass that mm. if I had the opportunity. Mm. And now that I have opportunity and people want to know my position, this is what I'm saying, that it must be partisan. The metropolitan, the city chief executives and so on, should mm. they also continue to be appointed? No, they should. It should be an 
election, electoral thing, not somebody appointing them. I know that the argument has always been, oh, they are appointed and they got to be elected. But for me, they should stand for the election, like what obtains in other, other places, mm -hmm. you know. Um, somebody has said that, but if you do it this way, and there's a party in government, and the local council, you know, the metropolitan, a particular area, is also in the hands of an opposition party. How are they going to be able to, you know, um, take care of it? I said, I mean, if the moment you talk like that, you have not understood the whole system. Mm -hmm. In fact, it will even serve as checks and balances. Mm -hmm. um, and it will also allow for development in certain areas. Because if my, my area is in the hands of um, a particular party and they don't do the right thing, it might even affect you know, them at the national and at a certain level. And so everybody is going to do whatever they need to do within the limits of the law. Mm -hmm. You know, within the limits of the law. We're speaking largely about decentralization. Mm. What was your experience in the, in the district assembly? It's, we, have we been, truly been able to decentralize? Because for me, it seems to me that we keep talking about decentralization. And to a certain extent, um, we, we seem to have been able to do that. But, but um, we're still centralized, over-centralized, I must say. Where you have a situation that everything is centered in Accra, and the, and the Minister of Local Government wills a lot of power in this country. You know, when we are talking about these ministers, we, we, we don't look at him. He wills a lot of power. Because he's the one who's controlling the, 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 the local yes. governance, the, you know, the districts and the MCEs and, and the metropolitan assemblies and all that. I think we, we, we haven't really gone, we haven't gone for thorough decentralization in this country. We, we're talking about it, but we need to really decentralize. I like to see a situation where I'm looking for a passport and I can go to Ejra, my hometown, you know, which is, which is supposed to be a, a, a municipal area and get, and get my passport and, and wouldn't even have to travel this far. And get your driving license. Get my driving license. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that I don't have to come this far to be talking about these things. I'm looking forward to that. Then I'll be able to say we have truly decentralized. As it is right now, I think we are paying lip service to decentralization. So you're a very prominent religious leader. Mm. Prominent religious leader. Mm. Thank you. What about religious intolerance? I think it's one of the things that we should not countenance in this, in this country. Religion should not lead to, you know, uh, one of the things that perhaps in, in our country we need to be grateful to God about, but we need to do more is the fact that we have not had serious religious conflicts as it's obtaining in some other countries. But I think we need to do more. I have always said that I always have difficulty with people who mount their pulpits or stand in word in the name of any religion to attack other religions. You live and let others live. What is at the heart of all religion? the love of God and love of your neighbor. We have not been called to be judgmental, to judge other people, because after all, the Bible even teaches, and I think the Quran also teaches that, judgment is in the hands of, of, of Allah. Judgment is in the hands of, of, of God. So for me, there is no reason why we should allow religion to create that kind of tension. I come from a home which is um, multi-religious. You know, there are Christians in, in the home. Even among Christians, you have, you know, charismatics. You have those belonging to the Orthodox, like, like me, those belonging to different, you know, shades of Christian expression. You have people belonging to other religious groups, um, some uncles who are Muslims. Um, and you also have traditional religionists even in the home. They don't cease to be uncles. They don't cease to be cousins. They don't cease to be brothers and sisters. Um, and if anything, religion should heighten my sense of love for all of them. 
So religious intolerance is one of the things that we should do the best that we can to avoid. Um, we have not been called to preach against religion. The Christian's gospel is good news that Christ died for our salvation. You may disagree with me, but that's what I believe. And the fact that you disagree with me doesn't mean you are an enemy. What about the rights of non-believers? Those who don't believe in God at all. Don't they have rights? Shouldn't those rights be respected? They do have rights. I mean, that's their religion. I have always said that if somebody gets up to say I'm an atheist, you're defining yourself against a certain thing. That's, that's your conviction. That's your philosophy of life. I need to respect that. That philosophy of life. Okay? And my right to practice my religion must also not be curtailed. Or compromised. Must not be compromised. I have a right to share faith with my neighbor if he wants it. If he says, don't bother me with it, fine. I don't have to force my religion down the throat of any person. I think in civilized countries, that's the way we ought to behave. So there's another very important issue, which is one of ethnicity. Mm. How does the Peace Council see ethnicity as, as a problem? Is it a problem, anyway? It can be a problem. And in our country, it's been really said, you know, up and down. If you look at the, the political landscape itself, when you, ha you are living in a situation where people can talk about strongholds, and the strongholds that they talk about is, can al always be defined in terms of ethnic areas, then you have a cause to be concerned about that. I have always said that I'm not bothered that I belong to a particular ethnic group, and I have a right to say that I belong to et this particular ethnic group. I have no right to think that my ethnic group must be the dominant group and that other people have no right to live. And so my concern is not so much ethnicity, but ethnocentrism. Mm. What do I mean by that? Defining everything from the angle of my ethnic group. And that if somebody is appointed, we're living in a country where when it comes to appointments, even ministerial appointments, we want to make sure that we keep talking about ethnic balance. When is this country going to grow? And when is this country going to develop for us to appoint people not by virtue of their ethnic groups, not by virtue of their religious affiliation, but by virtue of their capacity to deliver, irrespective of what religion, what ethnic group they belong to? I think the time... We need to work towards that. Of course, Chrissy, you know that um, these things don't come overnight. But we need to be worried about uh, ethnocentrism and work towards, you know, arriving at a situation where people are appointed not because they belong to any ethnic group or because of any religious group, but, but because on they merit. Merit, on merit, they have the capacity, they have the merit. They, they have what it takes to hold on to that position. Welcome back to Hot Issues. And we are looking at the National Peace Council. We are looking at issues, questions, which may contribute to the destabilization of our country, which may affect the peaceful atmosphere in which we live. And uh, just before we went on break, we raised the issue of the other Mm. disputes, land disputes, chieftaincy disputes, mm. intercommunal conflicts, mm. and so on. So how do you propose that we deal with these problems? Let's take, for example, the land issues. Um, unfortunately for our country, the land, land tenure system is such that, you know, a lot of our lands are vested in the stools. But even if we were to go back to our own traditions, the the, the chiefs were not owners of the land. They were custodians of the land. The land belongs to the people. And it is, he has to keep it in the interest of the people. We now have a problem because we have shifted away from this custodial understanding of, the, of, of our land tenure system to 
a feeling of ownership so that a particular chief might think that he owns the land. That's why in our traditions, you never sold the land. Lands were never sold. You lease it out for somebody to work with because you believe that later the thing will come back. Unfortunately, we haven't gone back to that. And I would want to urge Nananum to really look seriously, even if we're not going to go the way other people are suggesting that the, 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 the land should be vested in the hands of the government because knowing the corruption that is in the system, I don't really believe that even if you give it to the government, we'll be able to solve our problems. Let's take even our own traditions. And if we are to take our traditions seriously, no chief would ever claim ownership of a piece of land and use it the way he thinks he has to use it. If it is there for the people, then how it is to be used, the people must also be consulted about the whole thing. And then a lot of the problems that we have is that somebody is farming, making subsistent living out of their particular land. Somebody goes with money, a chief goes to sell that land, and they are prospecting for gold. They've been deprived of their living. I don't think that is right. I don't think that is the right way to go. And therefore, we need to go back. And, and I would say that the Ministry of um, Chieftaincy must not just talk about who owns what skin or stool, but we should also, they should also be very much concerned about interpreting these traditions that the land is for the people and the chief is a custodian, um, holds it in trust for the people. Um, of course, I mean, things have changed. In those days when somebody was a chief, he also depended upon the people because, I mean, as you farm, you brought some thing to the Ahimfi. Now, nowadays, it is the chiefs who are also taking care of the people. And therefore, <laughs> the thing they must take hold of the land so that they will be able to make money and, and then take care of, of, of the people. I think we need to really, if we are going to, you know, short of becoming anachronistic, if we are to look at the chieftaincy institutions carefully, then we need to look at the traditions governing these chieftaincy institutions carefully. The other thing that we talked about, uh, Kwesi, is not just the land, but the chieftaincy dispute itself. You know, we, we have a situation where there are certain people who have the, what you call the royal line. The lineage. The lineage. And sometimes I may be educated, and because I may be educated in my hometown, I may not even come close to it. I may be very influential. They see me on TV, so I use my position, and I go for, for that position. So time was when Ghanaians, when we didn't have, when there was ban on politics, a group of uh, many people, educated people, had become nananum. <laughs> now when we lifted the ban on politics, people are going into politics. Because everybody wants a title. And so the Nananum were very ingenious. They have now created certain stools in Kosuahini. I went to a place and they even have Ngumashuahini mm -hmm. and all that. Mm -hmm. You know, because they want to accommodate mm -hmm. these things. I think the, the National House of Chiefs, um, I know that they are working on the lineage thing. Mm -hmm. They should speed it up. And succession lines must be clearly defined. So that everybody knows that this is the situation. So that if A is not there, we're not going to be fighting mm -hmm. and, 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 and for all sorts of things to, 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 to happen. The other thing that perhaps I, we need to talk about is the, the, the way we are destroying the environment. Because you and I know that when we were growing up, you kind of were endowed with you know, the rivers. If I hear somebody saying a chinkwa or num bremu today, I say is a chinkwa or num pure water. Mm -hmm. Because you can't drink bremu. Mm -hmm. We've destroyed it. And why have we destroyed it? We are prospecting for diamonds. We are pri prospecting for minerals. Now, as you pass by, and I have had the chance to travel ac across the whole country in my capacity as a presiding bishop of the Methodist Church Ghana, and I get to some places and I weep. Rivers that I knew of, they've been destroyed. They've been destroyed. Lands have been destroyed. I think 
government must really, you know, the laws are there. They, it must be enforced. You know, rather than, you know, we keep on blaming the Chinese. But the Chinese, the Chinese who lives in this country wouldn't be able to come and go to a village and know that this is what is happening there. Yeah. It takes a Ghanaian to bring that person down and front for that person to destroy yeah. what belongs to us. Mm. I think it is important we address these issues. Now, sir, the, the violation of the rights of minorities, mm. how does that impinge on the efforts to ensure national stability and peace? I'm talking about, say, albinos, mm. Mm. homosexuals, mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and so on. Yes. You know, gays and lesbians and, yes. and, and all of that. Yes. I mean, what are your comments? Definitely. First and foremost, as, as, as a peace activist, mm -hmm. and secondly, as, as, a, as, as a, a minister of religion. Minister, yes, as a minister of religion, personally, my religion will not permit me to promote homosexualism. But I do also accept the fact that sexual orientation, people have different sexual orientations, and that there, are such, there is such a thing as people who would want to be gay, and not because by choice, but because they don't get turned on by the opposite sex. I have done a lot of studies in, this, in, that, in that area. I do believe that sexual orientation can also be helped. Psychologists are known to have helped people change their sexual orientations. But I don't think that we need to hate a homosexual. I may not like homosexuality, but we need to draw a clear distinction between homosexuality and the homosexual. Because I've known some very good people, academics, people who have contributed to the development of the human society, who were gay, who were homosexuals. You don't hate them. You may not like their sexual orientation, but it would be wrong for me to say that because of that you hate them. As a peace activist, we need to love such people. My wish would be that such orientations may change. And I must, I do not hide that. I do not want to come out to say that I'm promoting it because I wouldn't promote it. But if somebody is in that kind of situation too, I have no business, I have no right undermining that person, denying that person what he has to. We might need to look at the person on his own merit. It was Pierre Trudeau who once said in Canada that the nation has no business in people's bedrooms. This was a discussion on homosexuality when Trudeau came up with that. What people do in their bedrooms is their own palaver. Let's treat people. Do not look down upon that person because he is sick, because he has, he, he has a different sexual orientation. Accept him as a human being. Love that person. That doesn't mean do what that person is doing. What about albinos? Albinos. Albinos really are actually discriminated against. Exactly. You know. Exactly. You know. I mean. I mean. It's 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 a very sad situation, especially when they did not ask to be born that way. It's uh, do you call it congenital defect or something like that that has brought about you know such situations. I think we need to love albinos. In some countries, you know, I, I I'm told that some. Other, in some places, if you have an albino in your family, it is a sign of good luck. <laughs> some cultures have that. But for some cultures, they think that they have a certain potency. I think it is, it, was it in Tanzania, in those places where they've started, you know, uh, sacrificing some of them for all that. And in this country, we discriminate against them. Albino, they cannot be chiefs in many cultures yes, in this country. Yes. And, you know, there are so many things in our culture that needs to be reviewed in the light of, you know, um, what we are talking about, minority interest. If a person is an albino, he may not be allowed to be a chief and all that. Those are things that we need to begin to sit back and revise. 
has he got the capacity to be the chief? Is it because of, of, of his pigmentation, the pigmentation problem that the person has that will not allow him to become all that? I think these are things that we need to really discuss in this country and change things that we need to change. Mm. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, thank, thank you. We are most grateful. Thank you.